So it's been a while since we've looked at the GMMK from Glorious PC Gaming Race. It was back in like the spring of 19 when we were having a conversation about which 60% keyboard you should get. Now, fast forward to today, Glorious has finally made some much needed updates to this platform to make it more competitive with modern stuff. And we've also found ourselves in a situation where 65% in TKL have kind of captured more market share for small form factor than 60% because both of those form factors offer you more direct access to physical features in exchange for space on your desk. TKL is kind of that sweet spot for a lot of people. So that's what we've got here today. We're back with the GMMK. It's the White Ice Edition. We're gonna take a look at some of the updates, take a look at the price point and see how it stacks up versus some of the other releases we've looked at recently. You ready? Let's go! Yo, I'm Brian P, you're watching Bad Seed Tech, and today we're checking out the GMMK White Ice Edition TKL from Glorious PC Gaming Race. For transparency, Glorious did send this unit out for review, but as you should know by now, doesn't affect my review in any way. So the GMMK White Ice comes in three different form factors. You got full size, compact or 60%, and the TKL or 10 keyless that we have here today. A big difference right off the rip with the white version is that there is no option for a custom or bare bones. These are all three pre-built only. The price point here is $109.95 or something like that for all three models, whether you get the compact, the TKL or the full size. It does cause some confusion from a customer standpoint because the natural question is why am i paying the same price for less keyboard shouldn't it take less money to produce that keyboard that's actually a really common point of confusion when you look at manufacturing all the cost in that manufacturing is in the tooling that is creating the molds that they're going to use to create all the different components like multiple copies of the components that go in here so the cost to produce the tkl or the compact or the full size is only affected in a very minute way by things like additional stabilizers in the full size or having to hand lube or factory lube those additional stabilizers but again we're talking about a very minute difference in price which is why you see that across the board pricing here it's not like they're making wildly more money on one of those versus the other two. So diving right into the board here, the first thing I notice is that it's absolutely gorgeous. The top plate and the sides of the board are sandblasted aluminum and it's milled as a single piece in matte silver. Like the original, it's got like this polished reflective bevel that runs along the outer edge of the board. This creates a perfect backdrop for RGB to reflect off of. Looks amazing, especially in low light. RGB is a big star of the show here on this board as this is a floating switch design. The lower portion of the chassis is white plastic, four rubber bumpers in each corner and single height adjust flip down feet. These feet feel pretty low end, but should be fine for what they are. The board doesn't move around on the desk at all, regardless of the surface and regardless of whether or not the feet are flipped up or the board is run flat. They throw some extra feet inside the box as well, though you do not have to remove these feet in order to disassemble the board. You also see the keycap puller under the board here, actually in the frame itself. It's cool, but I doubt it's gonna be your go-to when you actually need a keycap puller. It's likely still included because it's cheaper to continue including this plastic puller than it is to redo the tooling for the bottom portion of this board. I personally like to use these right here, especially on hot swap boards because you have both tools right where you need them and these little pinchy guys right here make it so you can get down really close to the switch and really carefully pull that out without scratching the top of your plate or your case so the connector here is finally USB-C one of the most requested updates for the GMMK it's located in the center and it's flush mounted so any custom cable you have should work just fine the included cable is a pretty generic braided white USB-C no logo no colored insert on the USB six feet in length. Back on top of the board, we see bezels that are pretty slim all the way around. No obnoxious branding, only two indicator lights right over the arrow cluster, Feels stark and minimal, and I like it. It also feels well built in hand. Very minimal case flex, like you really have to get on it to get it to do this. Both copies I have also sit totally level with no rocking or warping of the board at all. The keycaps themselves are obviously now white and they're double shot ABS. They're very thick. Legends are really clean. If they hadn't told me these were ABS, I actually would have guessed PBT. So they're not that thin spray painted ABS but actually a decent cap. Good consistency on all the shine through and the surface has a little texture to it as well. There's a big difference in the overall look of this board with the new updated Legends versus the very OEM looking font on their older boards. You also get a couple other keycaps included like this gold ascend key or a stock escape key if you're not feeling the gold key as well as a glorious logo key. One thing to note with that glorious vanity key is that it actually is a cheaper spray painted ABS cap. It's not made from the same tooling as the rest of the caps. so not 
not only do you have a noticeable difference in the white color itself, but also a subtle difference in the profile as well. Included switches on the pre built are all Gateron Brown, so nothing groundbreaking there in terms of switch choice, but of course, this board is hot swap. The downside is that it only supports plate mount switches, so if you have five pin PCB mount switches, those pins will have to be clipped for compatibility, which actually isn't a super big deal unless you plan on reinstalling those switches later in a board that has no plate at all directly on the PCB, which I've personally never even seen. These hot swap sockets here are made by a company called QMSEN, at least that's how they're branded. That's not something I see a lot. It's usually either Kale a lot of the time and Gateron if not. So pretty generic ODM vibe, but I put this board through a couple full swaps and I didn't run into any problems at all. PCB is also in white, it's got surface mount LEDs and the sockets are all north facing. The stabilizers here are also done in white, and while they're not clipped to be perfectly flat on the bottom, they are generously lubed from the factory, and they actually sound really good. The beauty part of having Hot Swap here again is that you can access these stabilizers easily to further mod them or replace them if you want to, but you will be limited to plate mount only. Now, before we hit up this sound test, I want to talk about ping, because you're going to hear it in this board. That ping or that little metal ringing sound that you hear at the end of a key press could be coming from a couple different places. It could be coming from a case that's aluminum that has a lack of proper sound dampening materials, or it could be coming from the switch, either with the spring or that contact leaf. If you have a really quiet, properly dampened board, it's gonna bring out the noise in the switch. And if you have a really properly dampened, quiet switch, it has a tendency to bring out the noise in the board. So we're gonna listen to this two ways, both with the stock gap browns that they include, and then again with some Zeal Xilent V2s that are lubed with 205 grade zero. So there we go, there is some ping on this board, but we only hear it with the Gap Browns. The board sounds much better with the Zeal Xilent V2s installed, and not just because they're silent switches. So we can draw the conclusion that the chassis itself, even though it only has like the thinnest of thin foam noise dampening material inside, is solid, and that's what we want, a proper chassis that we can build on. In fairness, a full set of those Xilent V2s costs more than the actual completely built keyboard, itself but you can get yourself some lube go in and lube the gap browns that come with this keyboard and get a much improved acoustic profile for your board without spending a ton of money so the stock board actually sounds pretty solid to me not that i would hold it up to the same level as like a custom chassis but it sounds better than drops latest entry level board and better than the keychron k8 to me as well also of note here inside the case there are three large weights that i assume serve no other purpose than to give the board a little heft to make it feel more substantial as we often associate heavier with higher quality. In terms of layers, features, etc., there are a few basic hotkeys, shortcuts, whatever. You won't find any QMK or VIA support here. Really standard stuff like media keys and lighting controls. The lighting controls available on the hardware itself are pretty basic. If you do want to dig in a little more, like do custom per key lighting, you will need to use their software. The software is super basic with support for like three different profiles, lighting selection, and a macro editor. I'm talking really basic. Like per key lighting literally means per key lighting. So overall, I'm actually really pleased with what this board offers for this price point. If you're looking at something like the drop enter, do yourself a favor, spend the extra $20 and get this instead. You can still pull off that clean, minimal white aesthetic if you want to. Setting the RGB on this board to all white is cooler in tone and it skews just a little pink, but it still nails that clean, minimal look and you get hot swap and access to the stabs, which are already out of the box better than on the enter. Unless wireless is an absolutely mandatory 
feature for you. I would probably take this over the Keychron K8 as well, which we will be looking at in more detail here very soon. I'm sure people will ask me about this wrist rest as well. This is the glorious wooden TKL rest in black, and it's hands down my favorite wrist rest in terms of being a daily driver. Out of everything I have, this is the one that never rotates off my desk. So there you go. If you're looking for a TKO board, $110 gets you a really solid platform that for a lot of you may be all the mechanical keyboard you ever need. For the rest of us, it'll probably function as a gateway drug into the world of higher end mechanicals. About the only crime for this thing, aside from the fact that it doesn't support five pin PCB, is that it's not available in a bare bones. I would really like to see this thing come in 20 or $30 cheaper. Then we'd have some better conversation between like the NK65 over here and the GMMK TKL on this side. Nonetheless, they did a really nice job with this board. It's an easy recommend for me. As always, affiliate links down in the description for everything we talked about today. Any questions, hit me in the comments or drop by the Discord. What, too soon? And that's it for this time. I'm Brian P. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button, hit that sub button. And until next time, stay up. Mm -hmm.